Hi, this is the Social Jello with Angelo show. My name's Angelo. I'm a social scientist, surfer, martial artist, and a whole lot of other things. Coming to you live from Kasai City, Japan, the Social Jello with Angelo show. What's up, and welcome to Social Jello with Angelo. I'm here with the pitmaster, John Hackleman. And hey. we were talking a, about a week ago, and hey. the discussion question is, what are the differences between Kajikembo and MMA? Now, anybody who's followed the show, uh, this actually did come up during the What is Kajikembo podcast, which is at the end of every YouTube video I have, it directs them to that, so you can check that out if you don't know what it is. So I'm just going to hand this over to you, John. What do you think the difference is between MMA and Kajikembo? Well, the main difference... Or the biggest difference, or the reason that it's not even close, is MMA is a sport. It's a sport. It, it's you know, and 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 Kaja Kempo was made uh, as a self defense, um, a self defense system. You know, for life or death situations, um, schoolyard dominance, uh, no referees, you know, no shaking hands, nothing, you know, no, you know, no building up to it, no training, you know, for the, the date where it's going to, you know, you're going to go in a cage or a ring, you know, it's just, it was just for training to get better, uh, you know, for the street. And when I say better, I mean in better shape and better skills, better power, better speed, everything. And MMA is a sport. It's it's a sport. There's no, you know, there's no, you know, when, when you bring it in like that, it's not even close, you know, to, to being similar. But then again, if you look at their techniques, then it can be pretty much identical. So it's like, Wait, it's like they're doing the same kind of stuff now. Most real Kajikembo schools are training like an MMA fighter. Some still do kata and all that kind of shit. But, you know, the real hardcore Kajikembo guys, they're training like an MMA guy, but they're training so they can go home safe to the family every night where the MMA guy is doing pretty much the exact same stuff, but he's doing it to win a UFC title. So that's you know, it. That was know, it. I was talking to uh I was talking to some of the the Tumpai. Okay, so this is gonna I don't know when this I'm I'm guessing this episode will come out after the Tumpai one. So I was talking to the Tumpai guys, they do all the kung fu, they love the kung fu stuff yeah. and and they like the kata and stuff. But even then, there was a part of the interview where he starts talking about how their training was uh sparring with in street clothes with boots outside. And they were talking about how they would end up doing grappling outside in in and they like to do this thing like once a month or they're kind of like a boot camp where they do all their sparring outside in street clothes and um and they're and they're doing all kinds of stuff like so again like even the ones that are doing katas are still sparring and they're still when you look at it when he's describing what he's doing it still sounds like MMA training minus the street clothes right like they're wearing street clothes outside and they're doing all their all their drills and stuff outdoors so like yeah the the other thing i was going to say is with I, I don't know maybe you know more about this more than i would in mma there's always a point where an mma fighter retires right and then what normally happens to someone who let's say they don't come from some sort of traditional background they just did mma and they're an mma coach what's the usual trajectory for someone who retires from fighting i think it, they could they could come see me, get certified, and get their black belt in Hawaiian Kempo, and go open up a school and have a great life. But typically, if they don't do that, what normally happens? They, a lot, a lot, a lot of MMA fighters, a lot more than boxers or kickboxers. I mean, not you know all of them, but a, a good, a good. Uh, they're. Um, That a lot of them are um, um, 
college degrees. A lot of them have college degrees because a lot of them, you know, they their base is wrestling. And so a lot of them wrestled throughout college, et cetera. So there's that. But, and then there's a really small percentage of people like, um, like Rashad Evans or Anthony, Anthony uh, Smith or Dean Thomas, you know, who have um, gotten involved in, in, in broadcasting or doing interviews or becoming like, you know, the color commentator, whatever. And they, and they, they, they can make a living doing that. That's a very small percentage. So the majority just do whatever, you know, whatever their training or their skill or their, you know, you know, go to, uh, will provide them with, but they don't have anything that MMA provides them. You know, MMA, like, like retiring from, uh, you know, retiring from, uh, say you're doing, you know, karate, some kind of karate where, you know, martial art, a martial art, like Brazilian jiu-jitsu. They could, they could retire from competing and they can go right back in and open a school. You know, so that I, I find that very uh, saddening and I want to be a resource to help MMA guys that retire from from the sport and have no no skill set except for being an MMA fighter. And an MMA fighter can translate into being a, a black belt martial artist. And most of them are by the time they retire. They're black belt level striking, grappling wrestling and, and you know all that and they just need a belt and and learn how to open a school and they can teach wine tempo because you don't want to call it mma because mma is not a you know it's it's a sport it's it's not a it's not a system you know where kids can come in and they get belts and stuff there's no belts in mma but there is belts in hawaiian kempo right so that's what I think all MMA guys should do. But as for what they do, I think it's it goes across the board, you know. Yeah. They could be an MMA coach, but I mean the money in that, supporting yourself, being an MMA coach is is almost impossible. I mean, you're getting a really small percentage of fighters that are making a really small, you know, purse. So it's really hard to get started on that. So I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do. But if you are an MMA guy and you are getting near the end of your career, um, get in touch with me and I'll help you. Well, there you have it. If you're an MMA guy watching this and you're looking for something, you're looking for, for you, you have, you're trying to plan your future, contact John Hackleby. He'll help you out. So going back to our first question, again, like this idea that, oh, so you, you mentioned a few points here. The, the training is, Looks very similar because people say that a lot, especially for the for the guy for the more the Kaju Kempo guys that are applying more modalities for sport and self defense. Um, the 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 training looks similar, but it sounds like our end goal is um a little different. I don't know, like for me personally, for the Kaju Kempo, it just seems like the the end goal is to continue to do it for as long as you can. And since it's not a sport, we're not talking about continue to step into a cage and test myself against another person or, you know, try to make money off of it as much as continue to train, to protect my family, to keep people safe, to pass on what I learned to someone else and kind of run my school. I hate to, I hate to use the words legacy because I'm not my, <laughs> my school's not big enough to see use those kind of words, but it is to pass on something to another generation that's going to continue to to defend themselves and teach other people how to defend themselves. Is that kind of where what you're touching on yeah yeah i mean it, i mean you can think of it as uh you know other sports you know like people are done when they retire from baseball some people stay in shape jog go to the gym do other things and and you know some guys you know some guys don't some guys just get out of shape and fat and mma is the same way you know um i don't think uh like a, a lifelong kaja kempo guy is going to stay with it and an MMA guy that retires, I bet you huge amount of them aren't going to train anymore. They're done. And, you know, they don't, you know, 
they're not teaching and they're not, you know, training with a bunch of guys anymore. They're done, you know. So, yeah, it would be good to 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 stay with it like a Kaja Kempo guy, you know, that a lot of the guys do. But the Kaja Kempo without the if they neglect the conditioning, which should be part of their training as Kaja Kempo, not just going to the gym after and doing something different. Remember, you should always be a martial art, not a partial art. Um, and that's what you should uh you should do. I, I get up every morning, you know, and just you know, I just I visualize and I, you know, put myself in in situations in my mind and it makes me want to train harder, you know, like it's easier these days with all the shit going on out there. So it, it's it's really, I mean, easy for me to walk into my upstairs dojo and my property and I could get a whole workout and I motivate myself uh, just by, you know, realizing, you know, how fucked up our, our, our country is right now. And there's people just all over. And it just makes me train that much harder. And that helps my power, my techniques, and my my uh and my conditioning. So I mean it's that's easier to do. And when you when you come from an MMA background, strictly MMA, it doesn't have that street to it, you know. So you're not training that way like you are with Kaji Kempo, always talking about animal instinct and you know, killer instinct and, you know, train, you know, the way we train, you know, and the way our instructors taught us, you know, it's, it's all about the street. And so that's easier to put my mind in that, in that scenario when I'm training, I think back to the old days, you know, and, you know, with Godin and, and, and doing the shit like that. And that makes it so much easier now than it would if I was strictly from a, a, a sport background I just wouldn't have the motivation to, uh, you know, to, to train the way I do. But I would back then, because I was always training for a fight that was going to be in a sport, you know, in a weekend here or there. So I was always training. That was my impetus. That was my motivation. When that goes away, MMA guys don't have that anymore. Us, you know, Hawaiian Kempo guys, Padre Kempo guys, we do because we still want to, you know, be, be, uh, ready. And our fight is for the, is in the street, not in the cage or the ring. And, and I, I don't know how it works in your school. I know I'm in Japan, but even in Japan, I tend to have a lot of law enforcement coming in. Like a lot of law enforcement are watching Kaji Kimbo videos. Um, and they're coming in looking, even though Japan is, you know, it doesn't have the same kind of crime issues as the U S does. Law enforcement does have to deal with the crime that is around. It's not as yeah. prevalent, but it's it is around. And when law enforcement, they can train anything they want. A lot of the guys do judo, but I'm having a lot of guys come to college Campbell for the same reason, saying things like, "Well, I have to deal with people that are trying to take my life, right? And I'm training to to I have to take someone down and I have to arrest them and I have to, you know, I'm going to end up in more altercations. And the altercations aren't in a sports setting, um, All right? So, where was I going with this? So a lot. Oh yeah. So yeah, the street element, the street element. Because that you know, some people on YouTube, a lot of um, I, I hate to generalize, but there is a lot of MMA coaches on YouTube that kind of have a disdain for any time a martial artist starts saying the streets. Like, okay, it's a fun. You know, what will you do on the street? Um, it's kind of become like a cliche thing for some of these guys. They feel that when someone says street, they're um, when they're when they're emphasizing street and self defense. That they're playing, uh, what's it called? Like they're playing a, a fantasy role play of this idea of something that's not going to really happen. What is your response to that? I I, I don't have no idea. I have no idea what you're talking about right now. Okay. I've never <laughs> heard that. I've okay. never heard. I've never heard. I've never heard a guy do that or say that or. Yeah, I see. Like a, the, I, I see more the other way. Really? Street okay. Guys. Go ahead. So, like, what would be a, like? Like, do you know any in particular? Yeah, there, there's um there's a few YouTubers out there that that are quote unquote MMA coaches. Okay. That are they really? It, I mean, yeah, they are. They're they're MMA coaches. They are MMA coaches, and because they are my friends, I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna out anyone. <laughs> I don't like to make videos that have names of whatever, but they, I will say there are people, and everybody's watching knows who I'm talking about. Um, that make videos that kind of 
And I, I think it's a response to the overwhelming amount of people who say they do self-defense and talk shit about MMA. That's what I think is happening here. But um, yeah. But in return to that, so what would they say? Like what? Uh, like, they, they would they would say stuff like um, people who do MMA or people who say they train for the street, uh, really, are, are really practicing for something that's never going to really happen. So when they look at stuff like combatives and knife stuff, they feel it's kind of a waste of time to be training in that because the chances of you being in a, in a street altercation are really low in their opinion. So that's like, an easy, that's an easy one. Okay. That's an easy one. Right. Okay. So how many, how many people, everybody that wants to fight MMA wants to make it to the UFC. So how many people a year do you think win a fucking UFC title? Right. It's a, it's a, you know, let's go with five. Okay. How many people use, get attacked brutally attacked on the street every year like 1.4 million like 1.4 million as opposed to maybe you know i'll give them a high number maybe a dozen of, of the mma guys are going to ever win a fucking title so why are you training why are they wasting their time they're never going to go anywhere but the chances of getting jumped in the street are so much higher than your chance of ever winning a UFC title or a big MMA title. So why waste the, why waste your time training these guys that aren't going to go anywhere? Now, I don't agree with that, but that's the argument to that. I think anyone that says that is just fucking stupid. Cause I believe you as a MMA trainer, you should train these guys, you know, train them to be better people better shape, you know, uh, and, and, and maybe win a UFC title, maybe talk about legacy. You know, I, 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 I know a guy named Chuck Liddell. I know another guy named, uh, Glover Teixeira. I know another guy, Court McGee. There's a legacy, right? There's UFC titles right there, but guess what? I've also had dozens, dozens of parents say, Hey, my kid, his confidence turned around. He's never given bullied again since he started training. I've had cops come up to me. Hey, thanks for so-and-so, so-and-so that saved my life in the street. Or, you know, or guys, oh, man, I feel so much better now. I feel like my whole life has changed. So we get all, all the aspects, right? But to say that a street guy, how can an MMA guy say a, a street fight will never happen? What kind of soft environment? Did they grow up in? I've seen street fights since I was fucking six years old. I've been jumped since I was six. How would is that? How would you say? In, what area do you grow up in? Where you know what kind of gated community where you've never been attacked or jumped or had to use a martial art? That's just the stupidness of that statement. Is just I mean I shouldn't even respond, but I just did. Too soon? No, no, that's good. <laughs> yes. All right. So that's, the, that's the answer that I was uh, I'm not sure if it was the answer I was looking for, but I think I like I like it better than <laughs> I thought I was gonna get. All right, so so um yeah, so again, going back to this is when we're, we're kind of we're, we're breaking apart this whole thing, like what's the difference between MMA and Kaja Kimball? Like what are the differences between the two? And we definitely are touching on this this self defense aspect, um, and this mentality as he was as you were mentioning earlier. We also went on the on a point about the training, like the the end goal being different. I've had professional boxers come in, start doing kajikembo because they say stuff like I had, I had a retired professional boxer come in. He's like, "This is different. Like I've all, I retired from boxing, but you're trying to you're establishing like this." martial arts life like a life based around martial arts where you you balance out your training to continue training for the rest of your life yeah. as my, as the goal being before when he was a boxer my goal again was just to go in my next fight my next match and and the difference between that um i guess before we wrap up what are some are there any other differences that you can think of 
between Kaji Kembo and MMA? I think I think I think the similarities far outweigh the differences. Real Kaji Kempo. Um if you get the katakai with the point fighting shit and all that, then it's 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 I, I don't compare it at all. But a real Kajakempo teaching the real thing and then teaching really, you know, real MMA, um, the similarities are are you know much more prevalent than the differences in everything except for all and only the the end goal the end goal in in kajikampo is to stay alive in the street right and the end goal in mma is to win a, a, a sport title so your your end goal is as different as different can be but the way to get that is almost the same it's almost the same little slight differences there's like four or five techniques that can't can't be transferred back and forth um you know, you, you you have a camp, which you always you're always in training if you're Kaju Kempo, but you're not. It's not the same as when when you're fighting MMA because the weight loss, the weight cut, you know, the camp usually eight to twelve weeks, and usually you taper. Where we don't taper in, in Kaju Kempo or Hawaiian Kempo, we're just always right under peaking. In MMA, you want to peak the night of your fight. So you want to go, go, taper, 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 and then boom, you want to peak the day of the fight. That's that's ideal. In MMA or in, in Kajikempo, we want to keep people right under the peak, always under. Once you go past the peak, the peak should be the day you fight, and that's a sport. But if you go too far past, past overtraining in something like Hawaiian Kempo or Kajikempo, you're just always – gonna be overtrained you're always gonna be tired you're always gonna be um that was somebody, one of my old students walked by i was trying to let her know i'm doing something um i'm at ace hardware my wife is getting some seeds because she wants to grow some turmeric but anyway so that i mean that's i mean to me that's it you know just uh so many similarities, so few differences, but you know, I don't know. Did that answer the question? Yeah, you did. And and, and I hate to be biased here, but yeah, like when people look at what I do, they think they think it's MMA. Because I mean, when when I when when we're doing our sparring, when we're doing our training, there's grappling, there's submissions, there's round and pound, there's all that stuff. Of, of course, within an environment where they're not going to get any head injuries, but when they see the actual training, I've had a lot of guys come in and be like, "Oh, it's MMA," and I'm like, "Well, it's not." It's not, but when they're looking at the training, like I have to break down the reasons it's not. I spend more time trying to explain to people that why it's not MMA than trying to explain to people how they can use this for MMA, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, and the other Hey, do you need help, babe? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it goes the other way. I mean, because obviously, like guy like Chuck started with Hawaiian Kempo, you know, went to MMA, and now he's back. Glover started with Hawaiian Kempo, then he went to MMA, now he's back teaching Hawaiian Kempo and training fighters for MMA. So, yeah, he's both. And a lot of people are, you know, I mean, there was a lot of kickboxers back in the day that that did, you know, did both. They, you know, guys like Dale Apollo Cook or there's all kind of Benny the Jet, your I mean, so many of the kickboxers were karate guys too. Um, and they went back and forth in between their, their, um, you know their their sport and their street technique uh you know techniques so but mma isn't like that as much so i think it needs to be but that that's the main differences and i i'm i, I you got to tell me after we get off this who what mma guy thinks well what are you training for the street a street fight never happens i wish i grew up in their night neighborhood that must be the softest nicest neighborhood if they don't know why you need to train martial arts and they've never been attacked in the street, you know, then God, I, I wish I lived like them. But anyway, unfortunately, some of us, we have to actually train, you know, for the street because street shit happens. 1.4 million a year. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Right now in Japan, though. Not Japan, but even when, like, okay, so 
What I was telling you, I was telling you, but I, was, I told you, my, my L.A. story. Uh, Anthony Noy. <laughs> so my, my L.A. story, I, t- I was going to tell you off camera, I'll say it on camera. I'm always saying that I'm safe in Japan, but, you know, I went back to visit my family in San Diego and I ended up in L.A. We were staying at a hotel in L.A. because we were going to take our flight the next day. We go into an AM, PM, and this lady starts yelling at my wife as we walk into the AM, PM. Yeah. And she's like, she's ra- as we're in, she's in there rambling and rambling about something. She's obviously, she's obviously high on something. And she yeah. seemed to maybe she was young, like in her twenties, and I'm pretty sure she may may or may have not been homeless. And she was in the she's in the store. She's throwing a big fit. No one's doing anything. And when we walk in, she starts saying, "Hey, you you got you guys are tourists. You guys are tourists. You should buy me a burrito." And yeah. I, turn, I turn to my wife, and she looks at me. I'm like, just focus, <laughs> focus. Don't don't look at her. Focus. And we're gonna walk over here. We're gonna buy what we need to buy. We're just gonna ignore her. And she just wouldn't let it go. And she's like, hey, hey, bitch, I'm talking to you. And she's like trying to start shit with my, with my wife. Like, <laughs> and I'm just like I'm, like, I'm like, like, I haven't been, I haven't had to deal with a crackhead in about six years because I've been in Japan for so long. And I'm like, fuck, this is what it's like to deal with. This is, this is some street, <laughs> this is the kind of street shit that happens. Like, I was only in the US for less than a month. And I had like three different situations that something like that happened. I had to think to myself, fuck, I think the stuff's about to get violent and I'm going to have to figure out a way to deal with this in a non-violent manner. But if it does get, if it happens, I'm going to have to figure something out because my wife doesn't know how to defend herself. She, she, I've tried to get her to train many times. She refuses. Yeah, she's, she's got, got you. She's, she's got, got you. One, exactly. She's got me. So I'm like, all right, so how I'm going to have to restrain this person because it's a woman. And I'm, I'm thinking this in my head. Luckily, the manager steps in. I, I'm looking at the manager like, bro, like. <laughs> you, you got someone harassing your customers. So luckily the manager steps in, buys her a fucking burrito, and then has to buy her a bunch of other shit, and she leaves. And I'm just sitting there just scratching my head like, yeah, yeah. I'd be scratching my head like, why the fuck did he buy her anything? Like like I said, the entire situation was was a very uh, – I was re- reverse culture shock because I've been in Japan so long. Is there so anybody homeless in Japan? There, Are there any homeless in Japan? When I got back, I started looking for them. I'm like, there's got to be someone homeless out here. Because I'm sure they're, they're every they're, they're homeless people are, are there's not like they don't exist. And I realized that in Japan, when I see a homeless person, they keep to themselves. You know they're homeless because of the way they're you know, they, they they're growing out like a long beard, long hair, they have like a big backpack on, it looks like they're camping. And then I realized that there are homeless people, but after they're done staying wherever they're staying, they clean up all their shit, they put all their stuff away, and then they go hide. Because they don't want to get in trouble with with the police or anything. So there are homeless people. In fact, there's homeless people out here who that work every day. They go to work and they come back and then they park their car somewhere. They sleep in their car and they go to work the next day and they take a shower at the gym and stuff. That's the kind of homelessness that happens in Japan. So, but it's not like what I saw happening in L.A. It was that was crazy, man. <laughs> but I think we've deviated far from the topic. <laughs> What's the difference between Kajik and whatever? But the reason I'm ending with that story is just to add to the whole street element. And I was thinking to myself, I'm so glad I do Kaju Kembo. Like that's, that was like the first thing I was thinking to myself. Like, I'm really glad I do Kaju Kembo. Um, yeah. Because there was a lot. There was a lot of situations. A few. A few situations dealing a lot with people who may or may have there's, not. There's situation. You know what? That's weird because I thought of that today. Today, I was sitting with my. I was sitting with my family, and um, uh, I saw a guy stealing something from a restaurant. Right next door to the restaurant I was eating at, he was, he stole a big, um, a big padlock because they they used it for the fence to fence off the 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 lanai later when they, when they closed right. So there was a big heavy duty padlock, and it wasn't attached to the it wasn't locked, but it was attached to the chain. He took it off the chain, some guy, and he started walking. So I'm sitting there. So I hold on a sec. So I run. I run next door. I see the guy walking. I said. So I got in front of him. I said, "Bro, why did you take that padlock? That's not yours." And he's like, "Oh yeah. Well, I found it." I go, "No, it was on the chain. Fucking put it back." And and he did. 
He's oh yeah yeah okay okay and he put it back and somebody from the restaurant thanked me and and uh, and I thought first and he was a he was forty years old and I found this out because I talked to him later but in that split second that was very confrontational and I was I was the only one and he was the only one you know the, everybody else was in the restaurant but. I thought about it while I was walking back to the restaurant I was at. I was thinking that could have turned so bad so quick. I mean, the guy could have fucking just said, fuck you and came at me. Right. And I thank God he didn't, but he didn't. And my, my, I thought that that was dumb of me and I shouldn't do that. But I'm going to all the time. I'm that's just me. I ended up, I ended up buying the guy coffee later. I saw him again in the same town. You, you know where we you know where I was eating? I was eating at the restaurant we went. And it was right next door to that Italian restaurant. So that's where, now you have a better con that's where it was. But then later I saw him at the uh at the coffee shop across the street. And I went up and I just, I, I, I walked right up to his table. I go, you're not going to make any trouble or try to steal anything in here, are you? Because I'm fucking watching you, bro. And he's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. And then, I don't know why, but then I go, do you want a coffee? And, and he goes, yeah, yeah, can you please? So I bought him a coffee. And uh, then my wife came in and we we sat, we had a, we had a date plan. So we sit down, we sit down the, and he he comes up and he sits at our table and and we talk for about an hour. <laughs> but wow, I cut, that was a long story. But the point the point was that could have turned when you do something like that, like I did, that could have turned really, really violent really quickly. And I don't think it was a good idea for me to do that. I would have done it again, but I would not advise it. Yeah. So again, the idea that these situations do happen, and this is wait. The kind of you know stuff. what he told me while we were sitting there? <laughs> what did he say? While we're sitting there, he, I bought him a big coffee, and he's drinking the coffee, and he goes, and he's talking gibberish, like he's a homeless guy, but he he looked built and stuff. I mean, he wasn't you know really skinny or anything, but he started talking about just really weird things that made no sense. But then he looked right at me and he goes, yeah, I've been to your house. I've been to your house. I go, okay. He goes, yeah, Chuck Liddell was sleeping on the couch. I was there with your son, John Jr. And that is my son, John Jr. Chuck was sleeping on the couch for a while. And uh, I said, how old are you? He goes, I'm 40. So he's my son's age. And I'm like, holy shit. So he was my son's buddy, I guess. And now... He took a turn, did some drugs, and now he's he's homeless. But so big story there. You know, I shouldn't have done that, but now I'm glad I did. I'm glad I bought him coffee and I'm glad I got to talk to him. Bing. Yeah. Well Wow. I that's that's crazy, man. <laughs> that's, 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 that was crazy. That, yeah. yeah. But yeah, this is the kind of again, this is just saying like it doesn't always well, I think you made it some it doesn't always have to end in violence. Situations do happen. But yeah. um John, thank you very much, as always, for coming on the <laughs> thank show. Thank you. Sharing your stories. Always love it. And for my listeners, thanks for checking out Social Jello with Angelo podcast. Try to release at least two of these a month. And subscribe, like, share with your friends. Catch you all later. Peace. Don't let anyone take your lunch money. Don't let anyone take your lunch money. <laughs>